Today is Thursday, June 26, 2014, and this is the beginning of an interview with Mr. Gene Ross at the Rutherford B. Hayes Presidential Center in Fremont, Ohio. Mr. Ross is 79 years old, having been born on December 21, 1934. My name is Julie Miley, Manuscripts Assistant at the Hayes Center, and I will be conducting this interview. Mr. Ross, could you state for the record what war and branch of service you served in? I was in the Korean War in the Army. Okay. And um, what, I guess, area of the Army, platoon, regiment, anything like that? I was in the artillery, self-propelled self artillery. I was in a couple different artillery units. Mm -hmm. The one was uh, 90 millimeter anti-aircraft artillery wow. guarding the city of Chicago, and we will be talking about that. Mm -hmm. The other one was... Uh, the self-propelled artillery in the Korean War. Okay. Um, now, when you entered the military, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Okay. And how old were you at the time? Sweet 16. <laughs> <laughs> and where were you living? Clyde, Ohio. Okay. Now, was, what was the reason behind you enlisting? Well, I was, uh, I was in the eighth grade which tells you that I was behind in school. But in my mind, I thought I was smarter than the teachers and did have, it had no further need for schooling. Okay. So I, uh, I ended up in the Army. Three of us, a group of young Kids mm -hmm. were at the county fair in Fremont, Ohio, and the army had a, a, a recruiting bus there, and were kidding each other like young people do. Let's hey, join the army. Yeah, sure. Yeah. We went in the. We my older brother was already in the service in the army, so we went in the recruiting bus, and the more the recruiter talked to me, the more it sounded good to me. <laughs> It didn't happen overnight, but I, I told my mother that I wanted to join the Army, and she said no. And I said, if you don't sign for me, I'm going to run away and join anyhow. So she signed the papers that said I was 17 rather than 16. I went to Toledo, Ohio, got on a train. They took us to Fort Meade, Maryland. Uh, three days in Fort Meade. They gave us our clothing and some shots. And they had a mess hall that fed 5,000 men breakfast, dinner, and supper. It was a huge square, I mean, it was unbelievable. Huge square building. You fed in from all four corners. The kitchen was in the center of the building. And you'd march down there and get your breakfast, your dinner, and your supper. And we were all white. Uh, several barracks down, they were all black. And it's like Clyde, Ohio had no blacks. I, I, I saw black people mm -hmm. before that, but never any association with them. I don't think I ever talked to a black person before I went into service. Really? But I, you know, I, I saw the blacks down there, and there was a white guy with them, and I couldn't understand why there was a white man in with the black men in the army. But afterwards, after being in the service for three years, he was he was he was a, a mulatto, uh, a uh -huh. half breed. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what all they call them, mm -hmm. but it, it's not that unusual. Mm -hmm. To the the blacks are like the whites; some are light complected, some are dark complected. Yeah, there's. Uh, okay. But anyhow, that's a, that was the first time that was my closest association with blacks up until then. Then they, after three days, they put us on a train and sent us to IGMR, Indian Town Gap Military Reservation, Pennsylvania. 
<laughs> really? Yes, that was the name of the place, Indian Town Gap Military Reservation. It's up close to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, okay. up close to the state capital. And I took eight weeks of infantry basic training mm -hmm. there. And it was rough, but nothing like you see in the movies today with the drill instructors screaming in the men's faces. Mm -hmm. Our trainers were called cadrymen. <laughs> Just give me one oh, second. Oh, you're fine. Yeah. You take all the time you but need. Every, every cadryman, from the officers down to the lowest cadryman, would have been a corporal. Every one of them was a combat veteran. Wow. They World War II, some of them World War II and Korea. Uh, uh, well, all, the, all the enlisted men from Korea. Wow. They didn't, they didn't pick on you. I'm sorry. Oh, you're stupid. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I told you it's my medication. <laughs> yes. But uh, right? you take a shower, they're in their shower, and they, you could see their scars. And, wow. But they just said, you better listen, you better do it, because when you get there, you better, you better, it's going to be you and your buddy. Okay, eight weeks there. Mm hmm. They put us on a troop train and sent us to Fort Bliss, Texas, which is in El pa Fort Bliss, Texas, and El Paso. Okay. Uh, they touch each other. El Paso is down in the southwest corner of the Mexican border, then the Texas border. Well, it, uh, Texas, Mexico, and New Mexico are all right there within miles mm -hmm. of each other. Uh, okay. I took eight weeks of artillery training at Fort Bliss. Uh, well, it was totally different from the basic training in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, we had M1 rifles and marched, marched, marched. <laughs> at, at Fort Bliss, we had a, a lot more classroom training. And uh, we trained on 90 millimeter anti-aircraft guns to shoot down airplanes. Uh, and they would take, uh, we had a lot of classroom training and, and they would take us out and show us the guns and instruct us on the guns. And then when we were ready to fire the anti-aircraft guns, they loaded us on trucks and took us, I have to be careful, but I, I say it was 30, 40 miles mm -hmm. out into the desert in New Mexico. They, New Mexico, they called it McGregor Range. Oh. Uh, we fired the guns out there. But the, and the first time we went out, the, on, and you stay all night, you sleep in a pup tent in the desert, a pup tent in the middle of the desert. Hmm. There's nothing there but sand and cactus and scrub brush and white rats. Oh my gosh. Black rat, uh, uh, regular dark rats, but a lot of white rats too. I took candy bars. <laughs> I had, oh, I had at least a half a dozen candy bars and we pitched our pup tents and we had to go do something. And when I come back, all my candy bars had been chewed on by the rats. <laughs> and the, it was so funny. The one, the one time, there was a black guy running across the desert with a little stick, hitting a white rat. He's trying to kill the white rat, and he's running around long behind it, screaming and beating on the rat. <laughs> But there was no body to the stick because it was flexible, yeah. and there's there's no way to find anything. But it was it was funny to see. I re oh, you know that was uh, sixty some years ago, and I still remember it. Oh, all right. So when I got done training in Fort Bliss, 
I got orders, well, 30 days leave, mm -hmm. and then I had to go to Chicago, Illinois, to guard the city against a Russian air attack, which we will get into. Mm -hmm. I, I went home on leave. We left El Paso, Texas at 2 o'clock on Saturday afternoon. Six, six young guys in a 1950 Ford. Uh, we, we drove straight through, pretty much, and I had no idea that we picked up routes, the famous Route 66. I think we we either picked it up in Oklahoma or Kansas. I'm not sure, but we took we took Route 66 all the way up close to Chicago because we didn't go into Chicago. But they the, the guys dropped me off right at my doorstep in Clyde, Ohio, which at the time you don't think anything of it, but it's like wow. If I'd have had to go home on a bus, it would have been a real pain. Mm -hmm. But I've always been fortunate in my life. After my 30-day leave, I reported to my unit at Fort Sheridan, Illinois, which is just north of Chicago. But I do want to backtrack a little because i got to mention my friends. When we were at Fremont at the fairgrounds, mm -hmm. My friend Bob Sears and Myron Grimes were with me, and we all three we all three joined the army together. And the army recruiter said, "Now you guys will be together three years." We were together three days. I went to I went to Pennsylvania for training, and they both went to Camp Breckenridge, Kentucky, for their training. And I don't remember seeing either one of them when I come home on leave. But I do, I do know when I got off the ship coming back from Korea that Myron Grimes was on the dock directing traffic. And I stopped and turned around and looked at him. It's Allard Grimes. And it, it was him. We shook hands and I, I had to go because line number order, yeah. which means you're in line. I ended up in the artillery. Both of those guys ended up in the infantry in separate units in Korea, both on the front lines. Uh, Grimes was severely wounded, come out with a 50% disability. Both men were heavy drinkers, heavy smokers. Both of them married four times. Sears has been uh, Bobby's garage in that's Bob Sears' son. I haven't seen the kid since he was a little boy. But Bob Sears been dead for about ten years. Myron Grimes called him Skip. He's been dead for about five years. And I think they're drinking, they're smoking, and their multiple marriages. The war had a direct effect on that because that's what war does to you. Some people some people can take it better than other people. But anyhow, we'll get back to me. <laughs> uh, I reported to the 709th Gun Battalion at Fort Sheridan, Illinois. We had 120 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. And the unit was in Chicago. The headquarters was at Fort Sheridan. So I reported in and they loaded me on a truck took me down to Chicago. We're living on a public beach in on the north side of Chicago. We had four anti-aircraft. Uh, a battery had four guns. Mm -hmm. We had live ammunition stacked up, ready to shoot the Russian airplanes down if they come and bomb Chicago. This, it's the silliest thing in the world, but in 1952, we didn't know. The Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor in 1941, and nobody thought that was possible. So we were being cautious. The United States government was being cautious. All the big cities in the east were ringed with anti-aircraft units. Chicago, I believe, was uh, 
westernmost city okay. that had it. From there on, I, I guess they figured the Russian planes couldn't get that far. I, I, I'm no authority on mm -hmm. that. The generals normally didn't discuss that with me. <laughs> but uh, the 709th Anti-Aircraft Battalion was a National Guard unit from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. They had been activated. Instead of keeping them in Philadelphia, they sent them to Chicago because the Army is wise that way. <laughs> they think they know what they're doing. But uh, I would say half, half to 60% of the unit was original Philadelphia National Guards. The rest of us were shipped in, some draftees, some regular army. Uh, I don't even remember which battery I was in, but several of the men had already been to Korea and back. But, uh, the National Guard, the 709th guys, they were cool. 709th Gun Battalion from South Philly. They all wore their collars up. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. That was it. That was, you watch the old movies with the guys with their collars turned up. Wow. To this day, my, if I got a jacket on, the collars turned up. <laughs> 709. Oh, uh, I got there in March of 52. Well, the 1st of March okay. of 52. I was there till just before Christmas and I, I actually volunteered to go over to Korea to the war because I was stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, and I think I already said that when we joined the army, we well, I was 16, Grimes was 16, Sears was already 17, but we all three dropped out of school to go in the army. But uh, I, I, they were already in Korea by then. Really? As soon as they got out of basic training they and had their 30-day leave, they went straight to Korea. And I just felt that if my friends were there, I needed to go too. Dumb. <laughs> so I volunteered to go to Korea. And, uh, oh, I don't know, a month. It may have been two months before I actually got orders. But I did get orders to go to Korea. They sent me home for leave. And at the end of my leave, my parents took me to Sandusky, Ohio to get on the train to go to Seattle, Washington. The train was the Empire Builder. Runs from New York to Chicago, or, I beg your pardon, from New York to Seattle, Washington. The train still runs today. And that was, well, that was a trip. I just, it's, it was like, the, the, the scenery was so beautiful. Yeah. Uh, we passed, well, we, we went from Sandusky, sh Chicago. Uh, you didn't stop at every little town. It was a through train. Uh, they only stopped in the big cities. The trip, just sitting on the train, civilian train. A lot of servicemen. And I got acquainted with some of the guys. But it, it was it was a, a memorable trip. Hmm. I got to Seattle, Washington, went to Fort Lawton, Fort, La Fort Lawton in Seattle, Washington, which is probably about the size of this building. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a, it was a, sh a a transit transit camp is what yeah. it was. Uh, and I will backtrack and tell you about my train trip to Texas when I left Pennsylvania. That was a troop train. Nobody on there but soldiers. Yes, it took 
several days to get to Fort Bliss, Texas. You slept setting up in the seat mm -hmm. and they had an attached mess car. You went down and they slopped the food out for you. But it was also uh, never having traveled before. It was it was memorable going across the countryside, through the mountains, then into the desert. And hmm. I, I definitely remember those two train trips. They were really, really an experience for a 16-year-old boy. Well, the, the trip on the Empire Builder heading to Seattle, I was already 17 then. But anyhow, I got to Seattle. I was there several days, and they, they talked about seasickness. And I, I wasn't going to get seasick. Only the sissies get seasick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, we got on the ship and I'm like, this is a piece of cake. You could hear the engines running, mm -hmm. but you know, we're tied up at the dock. But they untied that ship from the dock. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I, I seriously. <laughs> This was February of 1953, early, early February, early in February, yes. It, I, you know, I have to think back. My memory never was good, but uh, real early, it was either late January, early February 1953. And as soon as that ship pulled away from the dock, I knew it. Boy, I knew it right now. Before that ship was out of the Puget Sound, I was seasick. Oh. I was seasick for 10 days. Everybody on that ship was seasick. The Pacific Ocean is an experience. Wow. I've never seen the Pacific Ocean. I've been on it three times. Never seen the Pacific Ocean without white caps. But anyhow, after we got gone, and within a day, either the front of the ship was underwater or the back of the ship was underwater, and you think it's going to break in half. <gasps> you're, you're you're going along, and the 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 front of the ship will go underneath the waves, and when it does, the back of the ship comes up, and the propeller comes out of the water. And when the propeller, propeller comes out of the water, it rattles real loud. It shakes. It, it, it just rattles and shakes. And, and then hmm. when that goes under, the back of the ship's under the water and the front of the ship's out. And then when it goes back down, it slaps, smashes. And that's when you really think it's going to break in half. But they don't. Wow. Boy. But seasick for 10 days, and we got to Yokohama, Japan, got off. I could see Mount Fujiyama. Oh. We went to Camp Drake for just a day or two, and they took most of our clothes away and gave us M1 rifles and told us what the situation was currently in Korea. And put us back on the same ship. God, did it stink. Oh. And uh, I don't know a day or a couple of days then we docked in Korea and unloaded. First thing you see when you're coming in is a big white ship. A spell ship. <laughs> big white ship, the USS Hope. Helicopters flying to it, flying back and forth from it. But you see that one first because the big white ship stands out. Mm -hmm. And then we got off and got on a train and, and went to Yongdong Po <laughs> Replacement Center. Dark, cold, confusion. Oh, but they didn't give us any ammunition, which is probably good because. Hmm. Yongdong Po was a suburb of Seoul. 
I, I think Yang Dong Po was on the south side of the Han River, and Seoul was on the north side of the Han River. But anyhow, the the, the next day, they put me on a truck, a group of us. Mm -hmm. And I said, which way is the front lines? And some guy pointed out the back of the truck. I never volunteered again. I never volunteered again. But they took us to Suwon, Korea, which was, oh, 20 miles south of Seoul. Huge Air Force base. And Boy, when I got there, I think, oh, that's kind of cool. We got tanks and half tracks. You know, it's gonna, it's better than those stupid old anti-aircraft guns. So I was, ass I was assigned to A Battery, 50th A A A A W B N S P. Wow. That is the 50th Anti-Aircraft Artillery Automatic Weapons Battalion, self-propelled. I was assigned to the 1st Platoon of A Battery with four tanks, four half-tracks, five half-tracks. The, the fifth half-track was, was, it didn't have the machine guns on it. Can you explain what a half-track is? A half-track is a, 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 a big metal vehicle with no springs. <laughs> uh, it has tires in the front and tracks in the back. On the back, like a, like a kind of like a caterpillar tractor. Uh, the tanks had twin forty millimeter anti aircraft guns, which can be used for anything anti aircraft. They for shooting at airplanes, uh, you can shoot them at people, cars, trucks. Uh, shoot into the side of the hill. Uh, the half track that was the tank. The half track has four 50 caliber machine guns mounted on the back of it and a, a man crawls inside and sets in what they in a turret and he can control it. He takes two hands and can swing it right left up down push the button and all four machine guns shoot. Uh, I was assigned to the CP as a half-track driver with the, my half track was number A100. It did not have the four guns on the back because it was used as a utility vehicle. Uh, must be the weather in here, my nose is <laughs> <laughs> uh, I spent a couple weeks, I, I don't know exactly how long, doesn't matter, but uh, several weeks at the CP I, I was primarily the water boy. I would go around to all the, there's four tanks, four half tracks in a platoon. I was in the first platoon. Two platoons in a battery. Uh, four line batteries in the battalion and then your headquarters battery. But I, I called myself the water boy. We had Koreans work for us and Korean soldiers assigned to us. But I had to go around to each tank and each half track and get their five gallon water cans because that's how we cleaned up. Take the five gallon water can, pour water into a dish pan and shave, shower, okay. wash under your arms, whatever you wanted to do. Hmm. Excuse me. But I, I would drive the tra half track down to Suwon to the water point, take a Korean along. And I can't remember whether the Korean was a soldier or a civilian working for us. And, and, and then we had a switchboard. And at night, I'd have to work the switchboard. Somebody's on the switchboard. Well, six months. I was there the last six months of the war. Never, not once, had a full night's sleep. Mm -hmm. Because at nights when bed check Charlie comes, uh, it's a uh, communist little communist airplane like a Piper Cub. They would fly over and they'd have little hand bombs they'd throw out the window just to irritate you. 
and it was our job to shoot them down, which never happened. But we had to we had to set on the guns waiting. I I never actually heard one. Uh, hmm. I was in a battery, D battery, and we're we're actually on the air base. Very, very right on top of the of the runway, practically noise, unbelievable noise hmm. from the jet fighters taking off all day long, and then after dark, the night fighters would take off. But that was they weren't they didn't take off like bees. But but anyhow, I I, I would run the switchboard at night. There was a second lieutenant was the boss of the first platoon. and I can only remember one other guy in the CP when I was there. The, th the three of us. We all three manned the switchboard. The lieutenant would take the early shift on the switchboard and then mm -hmm. he'd go to bed. <laughs> the other guy and I would, would Man, and when you're on alert, everybody in the whole, everybody in the whole battalion's up, sitting on your tank or your half track, and the radios are on in the vehicles, and the telephones. There's a man holding the telephone, never, never puts it down, and the radio's on in the tank. So you're getting instructions from two different places, and the the guy at the sea, nobody talks. You don't talk. Hmm. The guy in the CP does not talk. All instructions come down either from the battery headquarters or higher up the net. Okay. And my battalion, the, the I want to say the code name, but that's not what they called it. Call sign was natural. And a battery was natural able. Uh, my tank was natural able one one one. And oh, the Air Force was crocus. And the Air Force, the the instructions would come from the Air Force when you were on alert. And you're just sitting, and you can't sleep. Mm -hmm. You can't sleep. <laughs> But, you know, we'd sit on the tanks for hours while Bed Check Charlie's up there flying around laughing at us. Mm. But I do remember the, and somebody else could contradict this, but the, whatever was said on the radio was coming through the Air Force, from the Air Force. Hmm. But then after a few weeks at the CP, I did get assigned to the, Tank 111 as the driver. Hardly ever got to drive it because we didn't move that much. But it was neat driving the tank. Driving a tank's very comfortable. It rocks back and forth. Driving a half track is terrible. And I mean terrible. There's no there's there's no shock absorbers, no springs. <laughs> you and the, the seat the seats it's like two inches thick, uh, <laughs> very, very hard ride, very, very hard ride in a half track, unlike the tank. Hmm. I'm trying to think. Oh, you're fine. Uh, while we were on the air base, during the day, We'd have to clean the tank, wipe it down, clean the wheels, uh, work on the sandbags. Everything is sandbagged in. Mm -hmm. Everything. I did show you some pictures there. You notice they were sandbagged in. And uh, periodically they would t take some of us, load us on a truck. Mm -hmm. And take us out in the country to fill more sa they t sandbags, <laughs> sandbags and fuel oil. Uh, they would take us out in the country to fill sandbags. 
they might be, uh, I, I don't remember, six, six, maybe six men. Mm -hmm. And when you get to the place where you fill the sandbags, as soon as you slow down, the little tiny Korean boys would crawl over the back of the truck before they stopped. And they'd grab a shovel and hold it against their chest as tight as they could because there was more Korean boys than there was shovels. And a bigger, a bigger boy would c crawl in and take the shovel away from the little boys. But we would, we would give them a quarter of piece um, to fill sandbags. Really? And if they didn't work, there's, there's 10, 20 more boys standing waiting there in line. waiting in line. And the quarter, that, that quarter meant maybe the family could eat that day. The quarter's MPC, Military Payment Certificate. You didn't have American money. Mm -hmm. All money was paper. Paper nickels, paper dimes, paper quarters, paper half dollars and, and paper dollars and five and ten. I don't think we had twenty dollar bills. I don't even know if we had ten dollar bills. Because hmm. when I went in the army it was I was getting paid seventy five dollars a month. When I got out I was a sergeant and I was getting paid a hundred and fifty two dollars a month. But anyhow we would hire the little these boys are like our first graders. Mm -hmm. Swear on my honor, like our first graders. They'd fill the sandbags, and if it took four of them to throw the sandbags up in the truck, whatever, whatever it took. Uh, hmm. Uh, I went six months without a full night's sleep, six weeks without a shower. Wow. Uh, then the war ended and we had to start training in case of war. <laughs> uh -huh. well, uh, we were going through what they call a gun drill mm -hmm. and I jumped off the tank and jumped on top of a, another GI. Mm -hmm. and broke my foot, hurt my leg, put me in the hospital for two months. In the hospital, I got three meals a day in bed. They had a shower. It, it wasn't really like, it wasn't quite like a MASH hospital. It was a little Air Force hospital. Okay. Uh, but it was a Quonset hut building. Uh, I don't really... Very few guys in there that were wounded. Most of them were sick. Okay. Either sick or or maybe even appendicitis or something like mm -hmm. that. Uh, I spent two months there. My next door bed was. Uh, he was in the Air Force. His name was. Never forget, but then you do. His last name was Ludwig. Hmm. Ludwig. Oh God. Chuck. Chuck Ludwig. Mm -hmm. Okay. He worked in the bomb dump, and a hundred-pound bomb. Or, I'm sorry, a five-hundred-pound bomb fell and crushed his leg, <gasps> and we both had casts on. He was in there three months and I was in there two months. And the strange thing is within days of each other, we, bo we both got out of the hospital because he'd been in a month before me. Wow. And occasionally one of my friends would come to visit me and one of his friends would come to visit him. And we were the two longest patients stay uh, for duration mm -hmm. in the hospital. So they put us back in a hole. I think there was only three beds back there. It was kind of, kind of, it's hard to explain. Mm -hmm. I, got, I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> but we were, we were back in the hole. And they, they bring your food, breakfast, dinner, and supper, and bed. 
you could go to the PX mm -hmm. if you could if you could get to the PX. It was a, a long walk, and it was really hard to do on crutches. But you, you could go. Hmm. And I'm just trying to gather my thoughts on what all might have happened in the hospital. Bear in mind uh, the. Okay, the war's over by then. The war's do you, over. Do you remember where you were or the the moment you guys found out that the war was over? Uh, yes, I was at. You didn't. You didn't go any place. Uh, I was at the tank. Yes, and we were we were very happy. Was there a big celebration? No, because there'd been talk. The truce talks went on for possibly two years okay. uh, and I think the last year the biggest stumbling block with the truce talks was prisoners the exchange of prisoners because the the Chinese and North Korean prisoners didn't want to go home oh. <laughs> and it, and it, it was it was really a, a big well, it went on for a year, haggling back and forth. But yes, when the war ended, we were we were happy, but we weren't out shooting the guns like they were on the front lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. You, we had we had we all had guns. We all we did not have M1 rifles. We had carbines. Okay. We all had carbines because the M1 rifle was too big, too bulky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and and like I say, w there was ammunition, but you didn't. You you couldn't just start shooting because, mm -hmm. well, once in a while, somebody'd shoot a rat, which they frowned on because mm -hmm. it creates a disturbance, so to True. speak. Uh, but anyhow, in the hospital, yes. I would, I. I possibly once, maybe I went to the PX, maybe, maybe twice. Yeah, I think I got there once, and then, then they were going to have a USO show, mm -hmm. and my my bunkmate Chuck Ludwig, we decided that we were going to be smart guys. And we did, we did it worked. We got our clothes and went to the PX that day, the day of the USO show. And then when we came back, we kept our clothes, our fatigues, pants and shirt. That evening, they they loaded us in ambulance. And I don't know if it was one or two ambulances, but anyhow, we put our we put our clothes on and we put our pajamas on over the top. And you had robes. We put our pajamas and our robes on over the top of our clothes. And when and they loaded us in an ambulance and took us down to the USO show. And patients sat in the front row. And then the officers are behind the patients, and then. The, then the enlisted men back, but anyhow, they had this uh, nobody famous for the USO show. <clears throat> there was a, a a beer hall, call it an airman's club, right there, that you could go in in the evening if you weren't on duty and drink cruddy canned beer. <laughs> <laughs> so Chuck and I got there and. The the I don't remember the nurses, but the aides got us squared away, and we took our clothes off, threw them in the back of the ambulance, hobbled into the airman's club on our crutches, and had a couple of beers, <laughs> and come back out and put our pajamas on again over our clothes, and went down and sat right down in the front row to watch the USO <laughs> show. Nobody was ever the wiser for it. Oh. Uh, eh. And I swear on my honor, I, there's no need to lie about stupid things like that. But we had it figured out. Uh, 
the last thing I remember about being in a hospital was uh, an excursion to Incheon for ambulatory patients. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to go, and they told me I couldn't go. I said, I can do it. That was just shortly before I got out of the hospital because Chuck already, I don't know if he had his, I don't know if he went, but anyhow, mm -hmm. I did, I threw a fit, so they said I could go along on the excursion to Incheon. I'm glad I did, but they put us on a little bitty train like they have at Cedar Point. Oh, really? The narrow gauge railroad, mm -hmm. and we went. I don't know, 50 miles maybe, to Incheon, the town of Incheon, and got off the train. And I don't know where they went, but I went about a block, and that was it. <laughs> I turned around, went back to the, back to the train, because when you get blisters under your arms, you know it. Sure do. <laughs> it did. I was. It was just like dropping out of school. I was not as smart as I thought I was. <laughs> hey, but, you tried. Yes, <laughs> sure. I'm not sorry. I got it. Then I got out of the hospital. Shortly after I got out of the hospital, I guess, they said, you're going to be the tank commander of 121. Each, each tank, everything's got a number. Mm -hmm. And like I said, my, the tank I was the tank driver on was 111. Not, not 111. It was A111. The A is for A battery. The first one is for first platoon. The second one is for first squad. And the third one means it's a tank. Hmm. If it was, and there's a tank and a half track in a in a section. Mm -hmm. If it, the half track was the tank's one one one, the half track was one one two. And they said, anyhow, they said you're going to be the squad leader. They called it. Tank. They, we didn't call them tank commanders. We called them squad leaders. But you're going to be the squad leader on two one. That was tank number one two one. And the the platoon sergeant come and told me that, mm -hmm. and I said, I I only have an eighth grade education. I I, I can't I can't do that. Mm -hmm. I can't do that. I you know I'm not smart enough. And we we talked a little bit, and he said, "Give it a try. I'll have any problems, call me. Mm -hmm. I'll you know I'll give you all the help I can. You you take the job. I'll work with you. If you don't take the job, I'll be working against you. True. <laughs> so I I which and I was a corporal. Uh, a tank driver is a corporal. I moved over to the other tank." And I, I do have to tell you, each we lived in tents on army cots. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was trying to think when I was in the hospital, we didn't have real nice hospital beds, just little cots. They weren't canvas cots like in the tents, but, but they weren't nice. They weren't big fancy hospital beds. But anyhow, we we lived in tents with the, and each 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 tank each half track had a houseboy. What we call it. A uh, twelve, thirteen year old boy does your laundry. Anything you want him to do, well, it wasn't that much for him to do. But usually, the tents had a wooden floor. Mm -hmm. Kind of hard to explain, but it's something like this table. Mm -hmm. They they put the plywood down, and then they they put two by fours on the side and and up just like a roof and they throw the big tent over it and then there's a stove in the center one or two stoves 
in the winter time, then you had fuel oil. I, I, you would get cold if you were on alert. Mm -hmm. Battle stations, is what they called it. But if you were in battle stations, yes, you could get cold. But, or on guard. But the, 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 the little stoves in the tents always got, they were fuel oil. And it had to be the cheap, cheapest fuel oil that the government could get because they were always plugging up and and they'd cause fires and tents would catch on fire. And Jeez. you'd lay in, and we had sleeping bags, you'd lay in your sleeping bag at night and you could see the lid on that little stove. The stove was about two foot high. And you could see the lid on the stove jump up and down all the soot hanging underneath it and that <laughs> oh my god stink you always yeah it's fuel oil every time i smell fuel oil i think about the war mm. but the the house boy would have to clean the stove and we would we would help with that because we wanted to make sure things were done right mm -hmm. but the house boy did all kinds of things for you you never had to do your own laundry Hmm. And if the and if the kid didn't do if the kid didn't work, you get rid of him. You get another, another one. one. Another one. Hmm. But anyhow, then I was the sergeant at Tank One Two One. Uh, nice group of a uh, good guys, good guy. Blacks, whites, mm -hmm. Mexicans, Puerto Ricans. Korean soldiers. I didn't. I didn't cover that too much. But uh, the Korean soldiers that would come in, uh, we were supposed to teach them all about the tanks and the half tracks, hmm. so the, so they would know. Well, I couldn't speak English. We couldn't speak Korean. I was saying, well, did you guys have a translator in the group no. or anything? Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! But uh, so a lot of gestures and <laughs> yes. But wow. I, I remember uh, a Korean soldier's name was An Chang Su, and the other soldier's name was Lee Suk Kyu, and the third one was Che Kyu Dong. Che Kyu Dong was from Seoul. He was, <laughs> he didn't wear his collar up, but he was the city boy. I mean, and, uh, An Chang Su and and uh, well, Che Kyu Dong was a city boy, mm -hmm. but uh, the other two were both farmers. Both of them were married and had children, and were drafted into the Korean army. Uh, and you'd set they. More often than not, they wouldn't let a Korean soldier on guard duty alone because he couldn't understand what's going on on the radio. Mm -hmm. But he sat out there at two o'clock in the morning in the middle of the winter talking. He can't talk English and you can't talk Korean, but as you see already, I am a talker. Mm -hmm. But I would talk mostly with An Chang Su. Uh, An is dead now. Mm -hmm. Some uh, uh, my daughter had a boyfriend that had connections a few years back uh, in Washington, and somehow he I guess he checked with the Korean embassy, and An Chang Su and, and Lee Suk Kyu were both dead, and he said he could not find it, anything out about Che Kyu Dong. Hmm. So I never do. I never was able to make contact with anybody, and the house boy. I never knew his Korean name. Uh -huh. uh, any of them, any of them that worked for us. The house boy I remember the most was at one one one. We call him Short Round. The rest of them, the Koreans, I well those three Korean soldiers. And mm -hmm. short round, I remember their names, but uh, anyhow, by then you know I'm I'm 
uh, over at two one, mm-hmm. and that's a sergeant's job. So I I got promoted to sergeant, and you you have to take a oral test. Mm-hmm. I don't remember any written test, but you had to take a, an oral test. And it's a group thing. They ask you questions, and they're not they're not pushing it because somebody has to do the job and somebody that knows what's going on, so to speak. Mm-hmm. But I I, uh, I was a sergeant then, and then I was promoted again to section leader. Oh, okay. I'm in charge of a tank and a half track. I was in charge of 121 and 122. And that's a, a sergeant first class. Mm-hmm. But by then, I it was time for me to come back to the United States, rotate. It was time to rotate. Uh, They said, I, and I was due for discharge. Okay. Otherwise, I would have extended in Korea. But they said, if you, if you reenlist and extend for six months, reenlist in the army for three years, extend for six months with the 50th AA, we'll promote you to sergeant first class. You don't, you just, you just got it. I said, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. I was ready to get out of the army, so I I came home. Uh, when I came back home, I was on a much bigger ship. When I went to Korea, the, the name of the ship was the Marine Lynx, and I think there was probably a three-man crew and fifty GIs. That's about how oh, big it was. That's tiny. Yeah. Well, I'm lying, but it, you know, it, it was uh, it was small. It was probably a couple. Th- I don't know how many thousand. The uh, the ship that I came back on, I forgot the name of it, which some general. Mm-hmm. If the ship's named after a general, you know it's a big ship. But uh, I came back, I went over in the winter, the, the Pacific Ocean was terrible, terrible, terrible. Mm. When I came back, I came back in the summer and the Pacific Ocean was much calmer and the ship was much, much bigger. Mm. More men, but it was, a, a, a east, there's still white caps on the Pacific, mm-hmm. but... Uh, it was a pleasant trip coming home. Now, did you go into Washington? Yes, which irritates me. Uh oh. <laughs> because I went out of Seattle, Washington, and I came back through Seattle, Washington. And you can go out through San Francisco also. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was really hoping, you know, okay, I went out through Seattle. I hope I come back through Frisco. Yeah. But I didn't. I came back through Washington. Hmm. Um, I, I, okay, before I forget now, sure. I come back, I, I, I came back on the ship, got off the ship in Seattle, Washington, had not seen Grimes or Sears since we went in the Army. Mm-hmm. <laughs> After telling us we'd be together three years, we were together three, three days. days. Uh, I, I got off the ship in Seattle, we're, we're walking down the dock, and this soldier well, there's there's soldiers there, the permanent permanent personnel there, taking guiding us, and this guy standing there, and I walked past him, and I stopped, and I turned around, and I hollered, Grimes, and he turned around. It was my friend that I went in the army with. Uh, we shook hands, and he said he said, wait here. And I said, I can't. I'm in line number order. Well, wait here. He he was a corporal, which in the army is nothing. Mm -hmm. I was a sergeant. That was nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we got no authority. The officers tell you what to do. But I I left. Everything was hurry up and wait in the army. (laughs) Well, when I went to Korea, it was three days. 
I got to Seattle. It took him three days to get me on a ship. Oh, my God. We come back. I got off the ship at 10 o'clock in the morning. At 6 o'clock that night, they loaded us on a troop train heading to Chicago, Illinois. This troop train was all soldiers, and they had Pullman cars. Mm -hmm. Beds, you know. In the daytime, they make it up, and you can sit in the seat. At night, they pull the stuff down, and and they they had uh, black porters. Mm -hmm. uh, the porters made up your bunks for you, mm -hmm. and they had an attached dining car. Hmm. And when you get up in the morning, you go down and order. I seems like they would have three different things on the menu. Mm -hmm. But you could order your breakfast, your dinner, and your and your supper, anything you wanted to eat, and the nice Pullman cars. Hmm. And I, from the bottom of my heart, I, I just thought that, I knew the government was trying to tell us thank you, but I thought it was a waste of money. I didn't see the need for them to do that because <laughs> I showed you the picture. Right. Yeah, I mean, it was no big deal, but uh, <clears throat> I, I just thought that that it wasn't necessary for the government to waste their money on us like that. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like that anymore. I, 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 when I was young, I thought we had the best government in the world. Mm -hmm. Now, I now I think we're led by idiots. <laughs> Uh, the more money you got, the easier it is to get to Washington. And I'm not talking about Obama. Mm -hmm. I voted for Obama, and I'll vote for him again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't. Uh, uh, um, when you were coming home, did your parents know you were coming, or did you just show up on the doorstep? I showed up on the doorstep. I was not a big letter writer. Uh, that was going to be one of my other questions. Did you communicate at all while you were over there before you came back? Very little. Okay. Very little. When I went, uh, uh, my brother, when he was there, he mm -hmm. was in the infantry on the front lines, and my mother was beside herself. So when I went to the hospital, the nurse said about notifying my parents that I'm in the hospital. And I'm like, oh, I'm out there. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I don't know if I told her I couldn't write or what, but she said, they, they'll write letters for you if you want. The nurses, they were nice, naturally. But uh, I told the nurse no, that she should not have my parents notified that I was in the hospital because I didn't want my mom worrying. It was, and I knew I, I wasn't going to die or anything. And she honored my wishes. And I told her, I said, I'll write, I'll write to my mom and tell her. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I probably, in three years in the Army, I probably wrote three or four letters home. <gasps> really? Yeah, yeah. I'm still not a letter writer. Hmm. I'm more of a printer than a writer. <laughs> no. There's my printing. <laughs> I'm not ashamed. I, hmm. I can I can read and write. Oh, I I subscribe to the Sandusky Register, the mm -hmm. Fremont News Message. Good. And I don't know how I've done many stupid magazines I subscribe <laughs> to. But uh mm. Uh, I came back from Korea then, mm -hmm. and uh, the troop train went from Seattle to Fort Sheridan, Illinois. Mm -hmm. I had a, a month left, I think, roughly. Uh, anyhow, they said, uh, I went home on leave for a month and then went back and got discharged. Uh, got home. and. So what did you do when you got home? Do you um, were you able to take advantage of? Did they have a GI Bill available for yes. you? Yes, 
Uh, I, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say yes, I don't know. Okay. But no, I never utilized the GI Bill. Okay. It, uh, if it was available the day I got out of the service, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. But I, I know definitely the GI Bill was there for Korean veterans and uh, buying a house, mm -hmm. uh, a VA loan. Sure. We had that. I was fortunate that I never needed a VA loan. Well, we've owned my wife. Uh, my wife and I have been married 58 years. Uh, I didn't have a VA loan. When we bought our first house, it was $7,500 wow. the house cost. Uh, I think the house payments were $65 a month. And I've just borrowed the money at the Clyde Bank. Mm -hmm. hmm. uh, our second house, I think I got the money at the credit union. That house was nine thousand. <laughs> the house we have now, I didn't have to borrow any. <laughs> <laughs> That's always good. Yeah, it's a nice three-bedroom ranch with a two-car garage on a can't close to an acre in Clyde. Oh, can't beat that. Yes. Uh, uh I guess I'm. Oh, if you want me to keep talking. No, I got some questions for you. Oh, uh, oh boy. You're fine. <clears throat> um, what are your feelings on it becoming, when people call it a Korean conflict or the Korean War? It was war. Something like 37,000 men died, were killed in the war. Uh, it was definitely a war. Uh, I, I... I think they should pass some kind of law that says it's illegal to call it the Korean conflict, but that'll never happen. Mm -mm. Uh, it's, it's, uh, roughly 37,000 guys were killed in the war, and something like 52,000 worldwide died during the course of the war, okay. service members. and the. The first two guys at the monument, at the courthouse, uh, on the north side of the courthouse, mm -hmm. there's a monument for Korea, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. First name was a good friend, Johnny Smith. John Smith, very first name, the Korean really? War. Yes, close friend of mine. Second name was Carl Streeter. My brother's best friend. My brother talked him in and joined in the army. Hmm. First two names, first two guys. I. Well, John got killed. I think in August, July or August, as soon as the war started. Really. And uh, I wasn't not in the army yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, well, like I said, I was I was sixteen. I was dumber than a box of rocks. But I must have been. I must have. I like money, because I was working. I, I worked for the Isley Dairy Store. It would be like Toffs. Oh sure. Something like that. Are you, are you familiar with the Toff store mm -hmm. in Dusky, where you go yes. get your ice cream, your crap, and. Mm -hmm. uh, the Isley Dairy Store in Clyde, Ohio was right uptown on Main Street, uh, where Pfizer's Barbershop used to be. Well, it was Isley's before it was Pfizer's. The Isley Dairy Company, I don't know if they're in existence anymore, but I was a 16-year-old soda jerk. Aww. I I could make you ice cream cones, I could sell you hand-packed ice cream. We had short a short order if you wanted to cheeseburger and, fr and fries. Uh, I don't remember what all we had for sh for short order, but we had booths mm -hmm. and a counter where you could sit down. And we sold bread and milk and lunch meat. And the first time a lady come in said she wanted a quart of sweet milk. I said, we don't carry sweet milk. Yes, you do. You carry sweet milk. I said, we don't carry sweet milk. What's sweet milk? She says, right there homogenized. 
I got I got nothing against blacks, hillbillies, mm -hmm. or anybody, but she's a old hillbilly lady. Sweet milk. That's what they called it. Yeah, she said sweet milk. I had never. I mean, I know now. Yeah, I never heard that. Recalled. She wasn't a. She wasn't the last one to come in for sweet milk. <laughs> See, but you were prepared then. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the uh, the uh, Klondike bars. Mm -hmm. They still have them today. Oh, yeah. We buy them. Mm -hmm. My wife and I love them. They would have a free, a free, get a free, a free Klondike bar mm -hmm. card. Oh, sure. If, when you bought a Klondike bar and opened it up, if the yellow card was in there, get a free one. And I, <laughs> I was a rat. I used to take the, the cards out, <gasps> and then when a nice looking girl would come in and buy a Klondike bar, I'd give her a card, here's a, here's a card for her. <laughs> true, you, true, true. You were sly. But where I was heading there, mm -hmm. my friend John Smith, his, <laughs> don't laugh at this, oh, no. but his sister Zelma. Zelma Smith came in oh. and handed me a telegram. <gasps> I said, is this a joke? No. I actually read the telegram from the War Department where my friend got killed in the Korean War. I was like, boy, oh boy, oh boy. He's buried, they brought his body back. He's buried in Sandusky at the big cemetery on Milan Road. And I've been there. They're no help. They're no help. You can't find him? No. No. I talked to the... I talked to Sexton, I guess. I talked to a man that was working there. And I said, I want John Smith, 1950. I don't know if his body came in 50 or 51, but... I know he's buried there. Okay. And I wanted to go see his grave. I might be able to help you out with that. Well, if you can, that'd be neat. I will sure try. Yeah, because I... He was I, from Clyde? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, I don't know what his address, if he was living at home or not, mm -hmm. but okay. Church Street, they lived on Church Street. Oh, okay. Zelma and her older sister was George Ann. Okay. Zelma, George, Ann, and Johnny. All right. And Johnny was a couple years older than I was, but uh, how we came to be friends, I don't know, and it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Friend to friend. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Um, do you belong to um, any veteran organizations, anything like that? Can you describe any of those? Yes, ma'am. Uh, my first veterans organization that I joined was the American Legion. My friend, Glenn Kistler, somebody signed him up for the Legion. He was a Navy veteran. Uh, uh, he said, join the American Legion. I said, I don't want to join the American Legion. I want to join that for a bunch of rich guys. <laughs> oh, join. Join the American Legion. It's just, I uh, truly thought they were all rich guys, mm -hmm. you know, something fancy. But uh, he pestered me for a while. He's still pestering me today. As we went to <laughs> Washington together on our flight last week. But he, he said, well, come to a meeting. Just if you don't like it, don't join. Mm -hmm. Well, I went to a meeting. And it was all all downhill, uphill, or whatever <laughs> from there. Uh, I became very active in the American Legion. I joined in 1959 wow. in Clyde. And by the, I think, 1962, I was actually the commander oh, wow. of the Clyde American Legion. And at that time, they had, people were standing in line to be commander. Now, now... There's six or eight of us have a meeting out to the 
Eagles. Mm -hmm. Same guy's been commander for 10 years because nobody else Mm -hmm. wants it. We're all old. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think there's probably two of us in their 70s. The other, the rest of them are in their 80s. But I I joined the American Legion and then uh, during the Korean War, Mm -hmm. they formed the VFW in Clyde and I was asked to join. Same thing. I don't want to join. Mm-hmm. I already belong to the Legion. Uh, uh, some uh, Bob Godicki, he's mm-hmm. passed on now. He talked me into joining the Clyde Legion. Well, I'm still a member. <laughs> uh, okay, that was my first two veterans organizations. Then I I, uh, it was, I think it was quite a while after that before I joined the DAV, the Disabled American okay. Veterans, and the Fremont. There's, uh, the, the, the VFW, uh, sorry, the American Legion has a post in Clyde, one in Fremont, Gibsonburg, uh, Woodville, mm-hmm. every town in the county, Green Springs, they all have and the VFW is pretty much the same way. Uh, they have, they're all over. The DAV, there's only one DAV chapter in Sandusky County. Oh, okay. And that is Fremont. Oh. The Fremont DAV, that's the name of it. Hmm. Fremont, Ohio, Disabled American Veterans. But anyhow, I joined that and got active. I was commander there for three years. And uh, they've all died off. Mm-hmm. The World War II veterans, you know, are in their 80s, 90s, and 100s, mm-hmm. and they're dying like flies. And the Korean veterans aren't, we're in our 80s and 90s primarily. I'm 79, I was 18 when the war ended, so I, I, tend, I tend to be a young Korean War veteran. Mm-hmm. Yes. But, uh, oh, and the Korean War veterans have their own organization. Hmm. Korean War veterans or anybody that was stationed in Korea since the war because we're still there. Mm-hmm. Just like just like Germany and Japan. Mm-hmm. Why, are, why do we have troops? Why are our American soldiers still in those countries? Mm-hmm. They don't need us. But yes, uh, uh, I belong to the Korean Veterans Organization. Hmm. I there's no the closest chapter is Finley. Mm-hmm. There supposedly is one in Sandusky, but nobody knows anything about it. They don't. I've been told they don't have meetings. I mean, they do have charter, but there's not enough guys. Not activity. To, yeah. People hmm. in our eighties, you know, they don't want to. Yeah. Uh, people in their 80s aren't that, most of them aren't that active. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, oh, underage veterans. That's right. I belong to the underage veterans. The veterans of uh, VUMS, yes, veterans of underage down. military service. I've never been to a meeting of that. Okay. Uh, they do have their, they do have their meetings. Uh, I'm a proud member of that. I'm proud to have served my country. It was a very rewarding experience. Uh, I'm against war. I tell you from the bottom of my heart, not because I suffered so much in the war, but it's time to stop all over the world. It's time to stop the wars. They're not gonna. Mm-hmm. They're definitely not going to. But uh, uh, it's it's so sad. Young hmm. men. So looking back at it, would you do it again? Sad to say, yes. Oh yes. I can't change. I can't. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, not. For the war, but for the experience, for the experience, for the travel that it, uh, I, I truly feel that had I not been in the service, 
there's a good chance that I probably wouldn't have done any traveling to speak of. My wife and I have been all over the country. Mm -hmm. We've been all over. We've been from New England to Canada to Mexico, three Caribbean cruises, been to Hawaii. Uh, hmm. we, we've been all over the country. We've been to, uh, been to Yellowstone, been to... Hmm. Been all over the country, and I, but I and in answer to your question, would I do it again? Yes, I I would do it again, and I I think that in the long run, it's it was it was always a once in a lifetime experience. Mm -hmm. You know, they say glad you did it, but you wouldn't do it again for a mm -hmm. million dollars. Yes, yeah, something like yes, that. Yes, ma'am, I would do it again. All right, well, anything you want to add that I didn't cover? Or you've... Uh, the only thing I would like to add is that my life since the war, uh, I, I worked several different places because I kept getting laid off at Whirlpool with a bad economy. Mm -hmm. But I did, uh, I got, excuse me, I got out of the Army and hired in at Whirlpool and actually stayed there 45 years. Uh, I was a blue collar worker. The whole time I never worked in the office but I did uh, my last 10 years I was in the, in the environmental department at Whirlpool everybody everybody had a college education except me uh -oh. <laughs> it's a hard work will get you though yeah but it oh it was very rewarding experience being in the environmental department uh, I worked with hundreds of good people at Whirlpool, not just the environmental mm -hmm. department, but I worked with a lot of good people. I worked with some fart heads, too. Mm. <laughs> uh, I met my wife while I was home on leave when I come back from Korea. Uh, my friend, a friend of mine introduced me mm -hmm. to her. He was dating her sister, and he actually married her sister. And I... My wife was 15 when I met her. Wow. She was 17 when we got married. Wow. I made her quit school. We didn't. It wasn't a shotgun wedding. She didn't. Mm -hmm. She wasn't pregnant. But I told. I was ready to. I was. My wife was 20. I'm sorry. My wife was 17. I was 21, and she was going to be a senior. Mm -hmm. And I said, I want to get married. I got another year of school. I said, well, I'll either get married or we're going to break up. So, <laughs> And this was 1956. Her parents left her, left her quit school. I mean, back, back then, the education wasn't like today. Mm -hmm. Today, I couldn't get hired in a Whirlpool. Oh, no. In, in 1954, they didn't bat an eye. Mm -hmm. Sure, you're hired. Wow. Today... Absolutely not. Hmm. But, uh, we were married two years before the first kid was born. Uh, mm. our, we have two daughters, Kimmy and Tammy. They were <laughs> born two years apart. We have five grandchildren. Kimmy has three, Charity, Isaiah, and Natalie. <laughs> Tammy has two. Shelby Jean, the only person in the world named after me. <gasps> Her middle name. Oh, how cute is that? <laughs> she was, her mother named her after me. <laughs> and Riley, he's the youngest of the crew. He's 17. Oh, wow. Uh, Riley and I seem to spend a lot of time together just because he's he's got the time and I've got the time. Yep. But we seem, uh, I thrilled to death with my family. Uh, mm -hmm. Pretty much everybody's working except Riley, still yeah. in school. Uh, Shelby's going to college in Akron. Uh, <laughs> Natalie's a beautician in Sandusky. She just had, she just had our second great 
grandchild. Aww. Last Wednesday, <gasps> the 18th of June, mm -hmm. 2014, <laughs> I was on the honor flight at Washington, D.C. I was at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. They changed the guard every half hour. Yes, sir. And at 4 o'clock, silence you can't talk you have to silence your cell phones and my cell phone kept beeping that I had a text and they're changing the guard and it my cell phone would text I had three texts just like that Natalie had her baby she had her baby at a quarter till four oh and I I text back that you should name him Honor, little boy. I said, you should name him Honor. Well, they didn't like that, so I said, Arlington. Make his middle name Arlington when anybody asks, why Arlington? Yeah. Great Grandpa was at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier there you go. as he was being born. Uh, okay. Hmm. I've, had a, I've had a super life. I've got a good family. And it's probably time to shut up. Uh, <laughs> oh, you did very... That's it. Thank you for asking me. Uh, I, I'm i not bashful, as you can tell. <laughs> and I don't mind talking about my war experiences. We did move around some in Korea, but we always ended up back at that air base. Okay. Uh, and after the war, my unit never came home. They were disbanded in okay. Korea and in 1957, so I understand. It may have been before that, but my unit, 50th AA, was disbanded in Korea and they gave all the equipment to the Koreans. Really? So those South Korean soldiers did, they ended up with them, whether they wanted them or not. not. Uh, wow. Hmm. All right. I think you did I'm a great done. job. You're done. Okay. <laughs>